Hows and Hagen A Push. Today we're going to be taking a look at two topics, immigration and urbanization. America moved to the city. If you're reading any A Push book and you're studying the periods 1865 to 1900, we got you covered. And, and really a key idea of this time period is the growth of cities. There's a huge increase in urbanization and you could see that on the map. By 1900, 40% of Americans are living in cities and by 1920, it will be over 50% for the first time. And it's really economic opportunities in industrial jobs that are bringing people to the cities. And there's a couple of things going on here. One, you have a mass immigration from abroad. People are coming mainly from Europe, but also from Asia. You also have internal migration. People are leaving rural areas and heading to urban areas. And you also have certain groups, especially African Americans from the 1890s all the way up to World War I, which are heading north into cities such as Chicago and New York. And there's a couple of things going on. So you have both international and internal migrations, as I just mentioned, and new technology is allowing this growth to take place. And really you see in 1885, the first skyscraper, it's 10 stories high in Chicago. And remember, steel is cheaper now because of the Bessemer process and steel is becoming more affordable. You have the electric streetcars, which is allowing people to move um, across large distances in the city. So you don't have to live in the city center in Boston, you have the first subway. And with these changes, people moving to urban areas, you have changing roles, for instance, for women. They're taking on new jobs. Some of that new technology of the Industrial Revolution, typewriters, telephones, are creating new economic opportunities, which is also increasing a sense of independence for some women. Now, with these changes, come certain problems. Not everyone lived in the wealthy mansions that you see in that image. And the challenges that arise are many. There is a huge growth of urban poverty. There's a rising gap between the rich and the poor. Many, many people live like you see in that image to the right in very poor conditions. In fact, this huge population increase in cities such as New York and Chicago causes problems. There's a lack of clean water. There's limited sanitation and trash disposal. So you have poor sanitations in the cities. You have the rise of tenements and slums. In fact, the famous dumbbell tenement was used as a way to pack more people into smaller and smaller areas. But in these tenements, in these dumbbell tenements, you have the spread of disease like cholera and typhoid and tuberculosis. And neighborhoods are not only segregated by class, wealthy areas and poor areas, but by also race and ethnicity. So you have ethnic segregation. You could see that on the map of New York in 1910. Immigrant groups are staying in certain neighborhoods so that they can maintain their own language and culture, but also because of discrimination keeping them out of certain neighborhoods. And for instance, you're going to see this in Little Italy in New York, in the Lower East Side. It's going to largely be a Jewish neighborhood in New York, Polish neighborhoods of Chicago, famous Pilsen, and in the south side of Chicago, you have a largely African-American community. Even though there's no Jim Crow laws in the North, there still is unofficial uh, discrimination in the North. And African-Americans find themselves stuck in certain neighborhoods at this time. Now, key to this kind of city life is the rise of political bosses and machine politics. And these are very tightly organized groups. And political machines control the politics in the major cities. And the most famous example is William Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall in New York. And the process of these political machines was really simple. The political bosses controlled the rank and file of the party and reward its supporters with jobs. If you vote for the political boss, for the political machine, if you are loyal politically, they're gonna hook you up with positions within the government. In fact, what you see happening is one of the reasons why these political machines are so effective is because they provide basic welfare type services, which were not offered by the government at the time to the poor and immigrant communities. 
Now, this comes at great expense. In fact, you have large-scale greed, graft, corruption, and fraud was extremely common. And we saw previously that Thomas Nass exposes that uh, greed, especially with regard to Tammany Hall with his political cartoons. Now, a key component of this time period is not only urbanization, but immigration. And it's important you keep in mind that there is a different type of immigrant, and people made certain generalizations about these so-called new immigrants. The old immigrants were from largely northern and western European countries, England, Ireland, and Germany, we saw through much of the early 19th century. These new immigrants are coming from southern and eastern Europe, and we're talking places like Italy, Russia, Poland, and Greece. And there's a perception that these new immigrants were different, and in some ways they were. The old immigrants tended to be Protestant. However, remember with the Irish, there were a number of Catholics who came over. But with these new immigrants, you have the majority are not Protestant. In fact, you get a huge number of Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and Jews coming over. Another thing was the old immigrants tended to be literate and skilled. They could read and write in their own language. And many, in fact, if they were from England or Ireland, spoke English, whereas these new immigrants were largely illiterate and unskilled. There was this perception that the old immigrants were quick to assimilate, whereas these new immigrants were reluctant to assimilate. They were very clannish was the perception, and they stuck to themselves. The old immigrants came from countries where there was a tradition of democracy or democratic principles, where there was once again this perception and in some ways a reality that these new immigrants were coming from areas with a history of radical ideas like communism, anarchism, or socialism. And the old immigrants, especially the Germans and the British, tended to come over and they were not completely poor. Many of them were middle class, um, whereas these new immigrants arrived largely poor. And what you see is the reasons these people are coming, these so-called new immigrants, are the same reasons why all immigrants come and you could be breaking it down into two categories. Pull factors, America's ideals, you have political freedom, you have religious freedom, at least in principle or the ideal of it. Um, there's stories from previous generations. You're hearing about this, you know, mythic place America. And key really though in this time period is the jobs created by the Industrial Revolution. There was economic opportunity. And that's why you have this unprecedented large number of immigrants coming over during this period of the Gilded Age. Now there are also pull factors and this is key when you're talking about why are so many southern and eastern European immigrants coming. Well for one in Europe farm jobs were being lost to mechanization which means there's a lack of land and so if you lost your land you're gonna look for a new start because poverty and extremely difficult lives was the norm in much of southern and eastern Europe. There's also political instability in many of these places, especially Russia. There's a lack of political freedom and religious persecution. In fact, you have something called pogroms taking place, violence against Jews in Russia and in other parts of Eastern Europe. So you have this huge influx of people from a different region of Europe, and as a result, you get a response to the changing immigration patterns. One thing to keep in mind is many of the immigrants who came over were processed starting in 1892 through Ellis Island, an immigrant processing station in New York Harbor. And just like the old immigrants, remember, especially the Irish and the Germans, we had the Know Nothing Party. You have a rise of nativism. Except unlike with the Irish and the Germans, this one is going to be much more intense. And there's a couple of reasons. One is racial uh, motivations. These new immigrants were seen as racially inferior. They're not Anglo-Saxon. There's economic reasons. Um, there's this feeling that they took jobs, immigrants took jobs and lowered wages. In fact, many labor unions oftentimes oppose these immigrants coming in and will not allow immigrants to join the union. There's political reasons for nativism. There's this belief, there's this perception that they're coming over with these very radical ideas. And there's religious. They're not Protestant, which although we are technically a country with freedom of religion, many people at this time are viewing America as a Protestant nation. And as a result, you are going to have attempts at exclusion.
In fact, you're going to see policies of discrimination being pursued. We've already seen this with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese immigrants were not under the category of new immigrants. That is Southern and Eastern European immigrants. But you are going to see groups like the American Protective Association, which was an anti-Catholic group made up of American Protestants. And they really wanted to keep Catholic immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe out of America. You also have, throughout the decades, literacy tests being proposed. They are vetoed by various presidents, but in 1917, they are passed. And this was intended to keep the undesirable, the uneducated immigrants, once again, largely from Southern and Eastern Europe, out of America. And an important period of time that we're going to learn about in another video is in the 1920s, you're going to see the passage of quota acts, which will severely restrict immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Another thing you should keep in mind is the various attempts undertaken to deal with the problems posed by urbanization and immigration. And really, one of those is the social gospel movement. Um, and key to that movement is this guy, Walter, that guy. And the basic principle of the social gospel movement was that Christians had a responsibility to deal with urban poverty. And as Christians, you must work to help those in need. There's also the Salvation Army, which comes over from England in 1879, and their basic idea is providing poverty relief while spreading Christian values. You also see that with the Young Man's Christian Association, the YMCA and the YWCA, also promoting Christian values. And you see this very often, these reform movements are focusing on moral improvement of the poor or immigrants, Americanization in these attempts to help those in need. Unique is the settlement house movement because they are unique in the sense that they live amongst the poor and in immigrant communities. And Jane Addams is the key figure in this movement in the U.S. when she establishes Hull House in Chicago in 1889. And this provides various social services in the community and it helps immigrants adapt to the new society. They have language classes, English classes that people could participate in, childhood education and other services directly in the community. And they are secular based whereas many of the others were Christian in their reform approach. Another key idea to keep in mind is that there were individuals who challenged and supported the social order of the Gilded Age. And if you recall from the colonial period, there was this belief in the Protestant work ethic, where if you work hard, you were being a good Christian, and that was the path to godliness. And you see during the Industrial Revolution, the popularity of people like Horatio Alger, who wrote dime novels such as Ragged Dick and Struggling Upward. And it's the story of rags to riches. Honesty, hard work, leads to success. People coming from the bottom, now we hear. And this idea of the American dream, if you want to call it that, was reinforced by experiences of people such as Andrew Carnegie, who comes over from Scotland as an immigrant and becomes one of the most wealthy men in the world. Now the reality is, there were many, many more examples of people not going from rags to riches. And what you see during this time period are a growing number of critics of the industrial pro-business climate of the Gilded Age. Remember we had those people who talked about the gospel of wealth that justified their success at the top and social Darwinists and others. But you get these whole groups of thinkers such as Henry George who wrote Progress and Poverty and what he does is he critically examine the inequalities in wealth caused by industrialization and laissez-faire capitalism. And you have others such as Edward Bellamy who wrote a utopian uh, novel called Looking Backward about a utopian socialist society that has fixed the social and economic injustices of the time by adopting socialist principles. And what you see over and over again is people struggling to make sense of this new world of wealth and poverty and everything in between.
Eventually, you're going to get effort to reform these problems will eventually lead to a movement known as the Progressive Movement in the 1890s. We're going to cover that in another video. But key to the Progressive Movement is during this period, you have a rise of the press. Newspaper printing becomes much more affordable. There's a huge increase in education. Remember, throw back here for a moment, Horace Mann in Massachusetts during the age of reform in the 1830s, 1840s. But you have increasingly in the late 19th century compulsory attendance in school high school all the way down to kindergarten tax supported schools were becoming more accessible not just in northern cities and illiteracy rates were dropping more and more finally African Americans are going to have their own unique experiences and approaches to this era they find themselves in and one of the key figures you should know about is Booker T Washington He's from the South. He's an ex-slave. He writes an autobiography called Up From Slavery. And what he talks about is the need for African Americans to acquire vocational skills, uh, job skills, in order to gain self-respect and economic security. He's going to create an institute called the Tuskegee Institute, which is going to help African Americans achieve these goals of vocational education and he does not advocate for directly challenging white supremacy and some people are going to accuse him of being an accommodationist because of his gradual approach this so-called accepting racism and just focusing on self-help but for Booker T Washington economic independence would be the ticket to black political and civil rights and so therefore that was key to his vision on the opposite end was W.E.B. Du Bois and he is from the north from Massachusetts he is the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard so a smart dude and he helps create the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909 the NAACP and he is different from Booker T in that he demanded immediate political and social equality for black people that African-Americans should become intellectuals and resist prejudice and racism wherever they could. And he rejects Booker T's gradualism, and he is going to be a critic of Booker T, and they're both going to offer very unique visions for African-American liberation. And for W.E.B. Du Bois, he really advocated in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, the talented 10th in the black community should become the intellectuals to lead African-Americans towards greater civil rights. Finally, we're done. If the video helped you at all, do me a solid. Click like on the video. If you have any questions, post a comment. Tell your friends to subscribe because I know you already have. And keep on working on getting that 5 and 8 push. Get that college credit. Peace. There's a huge increase in urbanization and you can see that on the map. By 1900, 40% of Americans are living in cities, and by 1920, it will be over 50% for the first time. And it's really economic opportunities in industrial jobs that are bringing people to the cities. And there's a couple of things going on here. One, you have a mass immigration from abroad, so you don't have to live in the city center. And Boston, you have the first subway, and with these changes, people moving to urban areas, you have changing roles, for instance, for women. They're taking on new jobs, some of that new technology of the Industrial Revolution, typewriters, telephones, are creating new economic opportunities, which is also increasing a sense of migrations, as I just mentioned, and new technology is allowing this growth to take place. And really, you see in 1885, the first skyscraper, it's 10 stories high in Chicago. And remember, steel is cheaper now because of the Bessemer process, and steel is becoming more affordable. You have the electric streetcars, which is allowing people to move um, across large distances in the city. How's and Hagen a push? Today we're going to be taking a look at two topics, immigration and urbanization. America moved to the city. If you're reading any a push book and you're studying the periods 1865 to 1900, we got you covered. And, and really a key idea of this time period is the growth of cities. Odd people are coming mainly from Europe, but also from Asia. 
You also have internal migration. People are leaving rural areas and heading to urban areas. And you also have certain groups, especially African Americans from the 1890s all the way up to World War I, which are heading north into cities such as Chicago and New York. And there's a couple of things going on. So you have both international and internal migration.